as we open today's spring lecture in Pan-African Studies or Global Black Studies, as I like to call it, I want to begin by acknowledging that the main campus of Clemson University occupies the traditional and ancestral land of the Cherokee people. We acknowledge in the histories of violence, recognize indigenous and black claims to life and land, and work to recenter, uh oh, change my word, sorry. Um, work to recenter those claims as we commit to better ways of caring for each other and for this land. As scholars of Pan African Studies and Global Black Studies, we honor and thank our ancestors and those whose paths allowed us to be here. We strive to make them proud and build on that legacy. Thank you for joining me in that acknowledgement. And indeed, our spring lecture today will be presented by one whose path at Clemson aimed to make this space one that was inclusive for all. Through his work and his words, he exhorted us to see the stripes, to acknowledge the strength of Clemson's Black experience while calling out the shortcomings of the university toward its Black community members. Before I continue with my introduction of Dr. Carson, a little housekeeping. Again, we're all gonna be muted throughout Dr. Carson's talk. Um, his um, image will be pinned, so he will be the only person that we should see. Hopefully you won't see the rest of us once he starts talking. Um, but at the conclusion of his remarks, we will open the chat or ask you to use the raise hand feature so that you can unmute for questions. Um, I also wanna take this opportunity while people are continuing to come into the Zoom to thank our event co-sponsors, the Humanities Hub, Rhetorics, Communication and Information Design, better known as RCID, and the Call My Name Coalition. I would also like to thank Ms. Barbara Hamburg for her able technical support of this virtual event today, uh, Dr. Melba Persico of the Languages Department for her central role in bringing today's event to life, and Dr. Elizabeth Jimison of Religion, who will be moderating your questions at the end of the talk. Thank you all. So now I am gonna to begin to introduce our speaker. Dr. A.D. Carson is an award-winning performance artist and educator from Decatur, Illinois. His work focuses on race, literature, history, rhetorics, and performance. He received his PhD in rhetorics, communication, and information design here at Clemson University in 2017. His doctoral dissertation, Owning My Masters, The, Rhetoric, the Rhetorics of Rhymes and Revolutions, took the form of a rap album and, hit, and um, it was recognized by Clemson's graduate student government as the 2017 Outstanding Dissertation. He has since released the, the album I Used to Love to Dream based on the dissertation with University of Michigan Press as the first rap album peer reviewed for publication with an academic press. Dr. Carson was a 2016 recipient of the Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Excellence in Service at Clemson for his work with students, staff, faculty, and community members to raise awareness of historic entrenched racism at the university through his See the Stripes campaign, which takes his name from his 2014 poem. Dr. Carson's essays, music, and poetry have been published at a variety of venues, such as the Chronicle of Higher Education, Forbes, the Guardian, Journal for Cultural and Religious Theory, NPR's All Things Considered, Time, and USA Today, among many others. Dr. Carson has written a novel, Cold, which hybridizes poetry, rap lyrics, and prose, as well as a collection of poems, short stories, and essays titled The City, Unpoems, Thoughts, Rhymes, and Miscellany. His work is available at adthegreat.com, um, somebody can put that in the chat. Maybe Dr. Carson can put that in the chat for him. Um, and you can follow him at that handle on Twitter. Dr. Carson is currently an assistant professor of hip hop and the Global South at University of Virginia. He is the recent recipient of the University of Virginia's Research Achievement Award for Excellence in Arts and Humanities, which recognizes outstanding contributions by faculty who are creating new, new knowledge and creative works that impact society and have the potential of becoming a gold standard in their field. We wish you could have had, we could have had you in person, but we are honored to have you join us in any way that you can for your talk titled, Tigers Also Come in Black, Reflections of a Clemson Alumnus. Welcome, Dr. A.D. Carson. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Roland. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate this. Um, and I, I wanna say um, well, thanks to the Humanities Hub, uh, the RCID program, 
uh, Call My Name Coalition and all of the organizers for of, of this um, this event. Uh, and I do, you know, wish that I could be there with you all in person as well. And you know, it's unfortunate that um, that I can't. But um, you know, we'll make do. And also, I just want to talk. Like, so I said that it was going to be called Tigers Also Coming Black, and you know, like that's not real either. And so, um, I mean, and it's not real for the same reason that, you know, like a solid orange tiger is not really a thing. Um, so I kind of want to focus a little bit more on this um, lyrics from the album. Um, it say, um, like slaves embracing godliness, embrace the bodiless, authorship beyond consciousness, that's where the party is, burn down the plantation regardless. The ghost told me never feel fear the darkness. That's where the realest part is. Uh, and that's bad dreams. You might know him as Dr. Chendra Kumanika, but um, he's on the dissertation album. And those words are from the song Talking to Ghosts. And um, Talking to Ghosts is the name of uh, the most recent uh, project that I'm working on. And will I mean, it should come full circle if I do my job. Um, so I just want to say peace. Um, and if you have questions or comments or whatever, throw them in the chat and we'll get to them at some point soon. And uh, some of this might, you know, sound, look familiar. Um, if it does, uh, that is intentional. So uh, let's do it. Y'all good? Okay. I know y'all wouldn't talk back. The site of the most exciting 25 seconds in college football was made possible by profits from the most shameful centuries in America's history. But come to the campus of Clemson University and you'd hardly be able to tell it from looking around. Solid orange, you'll see. I arrived in Clemson from Illinois on the 10th of July in 2013. My brother and I drove a moving truck overnight from Springfield. I didn't know anything about the place. In Illinois, I worked as a high school teacher, a program coordinator for an after school program and an artist in residence at one of the universities there. But I was happy to have been accepted into the doctoral program in rhetorics, communication and information design here in South Carolina. I didn't know much about the campus or its history. The grounds are perfectly manicured, alluring, and monuments to the greatness that creates such institutions stand as reminders from whence we came. And since we gain so much from what we see, we smile proud of the, tradi the great tradition of which we have the benefit of saying we are now a part. Solid orange, we are. If you had toured Fort Hill I'm sorry, the first time I uh, visited Fort Hill, there were two older white women who asked if I was new in town. As actually, they asked if I was a freshman, their words. Because it was Friday and I was wearing a black shirt. I love black. I told them no, that I was a graduate student. And when they told me that, uh, every and, and that's when they told me everybody wears orange on Fridays. Later, I jokingly said to someone online, I guess I represent the stripes. In that moment, I just went on about my tour of the plantation house. And it's easy to buy in. It starts with the song that shakes the Southland and a sea of solid orange, tiger rags that kind of grab you and say, you are now a member of this family. You are now a Clemson tiger. Wear your orange proudly. If you had toured Fort Hill during that time, then you would know that it was a surreal experience. Enslaved people euphemistically referred to as employees and workers. Calhoun lauded as a statesman with steadfast principles. Clemson, a place where, quote, everything we do reflects on every tiger. It's just part of what makes Clemson uniquely Clemson, end quote. But it's a pretty well-known fact that tigers have stripes and almost as well-known as the reason they do. Yet Clemson University, home of the Tigers, doesn't do much acknowledging of those dark marks it knows to be so integral a part of its existence. Solid orange, we say. 
My first Saturday in Clemson was the day George Zimmerman was acquitted of the murder of Trayvon Martin. I didn't know very many people in town. One of my friends, Bryant, was with me when I uh, wrote and recorded the song right here in America to the beat of Jay-Z's Somewhere in America in response. The closing lyrics, somewhere in America looking to target me is a man thinking birth of a nation without a sheep who feels his grounds need stood and probably since I ain't his property won't properly pardon me but feels like I'm harboring some aggression and ought to be more respectful and honoring that I'm here. So he wants to teach me a lesson except I know what I know and it's just this. These fists, these feet, this brain, and this heart can't be dismissed without laying a few scars. So somewhere in America, they're fearing because it's scarier that right here in America, we're ready. At this university that was once a plantation, slavery being a positive good, according to Master Calhoun, whose house sits still on a plot atop a hill overlooking the football field, open seven days a week, and I can even enter through the front door. Dr. Rhonda Thomas delivered a talk on her essay, Slaves of the State, Convict Labor in Clemson University Land and Legacy that was going to appear in the South Carolina Review in spring 2014. And it gave me an idea related to the kind of work I'd already, I'd already been doing. To take the noise, the excuses for vigilantism, uh, the desire for black compliance, the unbearable silence about what was going on in the world related to what I saw every day walking campus, walking the campus. Take that noise and make it into music. What I cannot do, however, is depend on the tour guide to give me the whole history of the foundations of my university because for some reason or another, it's uncomfortable for some people to talk about slave owners, supremacists, and segregationists on those terms or it's unknown to the individual responsible for the dissemination of that information about this place. But 20 score and many more years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent, our forefathers and our foremothers and exploited them for hundreds of years, which led to our being conceived in captivity and dedicated to the proposition that history is a matter of telling the story that makes us look best. Solid orange, I think. And that's how See the Stripes started. My program advisor, that's Victor Vitanza, gave me the opportunity that summer to travel to Sasfe, Switzerland, to attend the European Graduate School. I stayed about an hour from the village James Baldwin describes in his essay, Stranger in the Village. I finished the first draft of, See the Stripe, of the See the Stripes text in between reading my Baldwin anthology and attending the lectures there. And that forces me to confront my active participation in not only the crime, but the cover-up, the whitewashing with orange of the dark parts of a history meant to be instructional lest we repeat it. When I got back to campus, I finished another draft and then I called my friend Craig and asked him if he would help me film the video. Craig is from my hometown, Decatur, Illinois. He was almost finished with his PhD in another program. I finished the first draft of the video and showed it to Bryant and one of the new professors in the communication department, Dr. Chindra Kumanika. Bryant asked me if I was sure this is what I want to do. I was. And I repeatedly walked past the Strom Thurmond Institute of Government and Public Affairs and wonder, was it there that our ancestors were whipped? Because it happened. Then I took the draft of the video to share it with Dr. Thomas. I remember us uh, uh, taking a few moments to pause before we began talking about the draft because she was emotional after that first viewing. It was a moving uh, experience for both of us, I believe. It was an articulation of something that had been said before, but arranged in a way we were sure would grab folks' attention. After I posted the final version of the video online in August 2014, things got interesting really quickly. I remember silencing my phone because I didn't have the energy to even read any more of the things people had to say in response online and via text and email. Somebody at the university called to see if I had a statement um, about me reportedly saying 
the football players were slaves. I said what I said, but that's a misquote. Slavery was big business and being black meant you made profits to keep your master in the black. And if the master went into the red, he'd see red and you'd likely wear red stripes across your back. Fact. A Clemson professor, J. David Woodard, had been quoted saying, see the stripes was fascism. Well, the quote is there. It's looking at things only through racial lenses and not seeing anything else when in fact there is no racism associated with this. And if that is an uncomfortable truth for the institution, so be it. These are the stripes we bear, so see them. Slavery, sharecropping, and convict lab labor paved the streets and sidewalks of this high seminary of learning, and earning a degree from here tethers me to the legacy of that and John C. Calhoun, Strom Thurmond, Thomas Green Clemson, and Pitchfork Ben Tillman, who, with his henchmen, killed Black members of a militia, never to be convicted but elected to public office, governor, to have statues and buildings erected in his honor eventually. The one on this beautiful campus houses the Calhoun Honors College and the School of Education. I wrote an essay for The Guardian titled, My South Carolina University is Whitewashing Its Complex Racial History. <laughs> I wanted to say racist history, but whatever. I didn't write the headline. So be it, if it's uncomfortable to bear those stripes, see them. By the time See the Stripes was launched, Eric Garner had been killed in Staten Island in July. John Crawford III was killed in Beaver Creek, Ohio in August. And, in, and Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, Saturday, August 9th, 2014. That Monday was graduate teacher orientation. I couldn't focus on the workshops because I was glued to social media trying to see what was happening so close to home. I was starting my second year as a doctoral student, overwhelmed by what was going on there, as well as what was happening across the country and right here on campus. But the football team was good. Because it's not uncomfortable to reap the benefits of the labor that went into the building of the buildings or tending the land, but very much so knowing the buildings and the land are stained with years upon years of the blood, sweat, and tears of slaves and sharecroppers and so-called criminals who were lit to the institution to do the work that needed doing. Solid orange, they say. An undergraduate student named Tucker Hips was killed in an incident with the fraternity on Lake Hartwell in September. Tamir Rice was shot in Cleveland, Ohio in November. That same month, no indictment was announced for Darren Wilson killing Michael Brown. The vice president of student affairs left Clemson in the wake of the undergraduate fraternity incident in December and Almeda Jax was hired as the interim. That same day, no indictment was announced for the officer who killed Eric Garner. I posted on the Caesar Stripes social media pages that anybody who wanted a space to just sit with other people and process the disappointing outcome to meet in Hendrix. And we sat in that space until it closed. And then Dr. Kumanika found us a space in Daniel Hall where he ordered pizza and we talked and watched videos and listened to music in an effort to be for one another the kind of community that we didn't feel existed there. The next day, there was a die-in on Bowman Field. And I say, the tiger cannot survive without its stripes. Two days after the die-in on a Saturday, some students dressed up in attire they thought gang members might wear and had what they called a Christmas party. I remember being at a holiday get together with graduate students when I started getting pictures that had been posted online from their event. I went home and wrote about it and posted online what it was like living in a place where one moment, a diverse group of people could be together demonstrating against state violence against Black people. And the next moment, it seems like other people on campus were either incredibly ignorant and insensitive or flagrantly offensive enough to extend their tradition of Blackface parties and racially themed revelry, even at this particular time on campus and in America. We cannot ignore the troubling history that brought us to this, our glorious institution with its memorials and monuments to 
honorable men and call ourselves a family. That Sunday morning, some folks decided that we should gather at the Cooper Library Bridge with the intent to deliver Christmas cards to President Clements's house. Because those plans were posted all over social media, he clearly knew something was being planned and issued an email stating, quote, the free expression of opinion must not cross the line and become harassment or intimidation, just as rallies and protest marches must not cross the line to lawlessness, end quote. And we're damned if we think we're doing ourselves any favors coloring the history one hue. Over the winter break, we organized. We took the complaints other students submitted during several town hall style meetings and combined them into grievances and demands to the administration from a coalition of concerned students. They were hosted on the See the Stripes webpage and delivered after a march on January 7th, 2015. Among them were calls to increase diversity in the student body and faculty and to rename buildings named for human traffickers, segregationists, and white supremacists. We also asked that diversity be included among the university's core values of integrity, honor, and respect, and that incoming students be mandatorily educated about Clemson's history and faculty and administrators receive diversity training. One you, one me, one he, one she, one them won't be, one us till we strive to see those stripes. A year went by with no acknowledgement. During that time, there were debates on campus about Ben Tillman and the building with his name on it. We had just started calling it Old Main since that was its historical name. The Graduate Student Government and Faculty Senate issued resolutions to rename the building. The chairman of the Board of Trustees said they would not. During that spring, Walter Scott was killed in North Charleston, South Carolina, and Freddie Gray was murdered in Baltimore. The tiger cannot survive without them. That summer, I stayed in Clemson, the site of the most exciting 25 seconds in college football was made possible by profits from the most shameful centuries in America's history. In May 2015, Michael Slager was indicted for killing Walter Scott and six Baltimore officers were indicted for killing Freddie Gray. In June, I was sitting at a friend's house when I saw it posted online that there was a shooting at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. Me and Tendra, I drove out there. In front of the church, we talked to people who'd grown up there and watched the crowds of people swell and dissipate over the days after. Chandra, I was reporting for NPR and I wrote something for the conversation. Back on campus, there was a memorial service after which the wreaths to honor the deceased were taken to be displayed at the military plaza behind Bowman Field. But we all know that that plaza is in front of the building named for the man who bragged about murdering a black state senator named Simon Coker who was, in the moments before being assassinated, kneeling in prayer. They were either incredibly ignorant and insensitive or flagrantly offensive enough to consider this an honor to the lives and legacies of the Senator and eight others who were just killed in Charleston. Those are the stripes we bear. And before you decide to wear that orange tee or that painted paw, Ree Newsom removed the flag from the South Carolina State House that summer. Think for a moment about those stripes. The next month, South Carolina officially removed the flag. Think of the backs of the slaves. That same day, Sandra Bland was pulled over and detained by police in Hempstead, Texas. Think about the strips of land and the sharecroppers tied to it after so-called emancipation. That summer ended with the KKK rally at the South Carolina State Capitol. Think of the uniform of that 13-year-old boy, a slave of the state, forced to help build the first buildings at this place. His name was Wade Foster. Think of the dark matters that matter more than you know, 
the difference between willing ignorance and active participation, complicit denial and abject perpetuation. Though they weren't going to change the name of the building, the board of trustees renounced Tillman, whatever that means, and announced the establishment of a task force on, quote, how to best preserve and tell the complete history of Clemson University, end quote. Before you think solid orange, we decided to have another march, this time to rec reclaim Old Main and urge anyone who would listen to take heed. Think of how ridiculous a solid orange tiger would look. This was also the semester that the University of Missouri football team joined the protest on their campus. Their mascot is a tiger as well. Think of seeing its stripes. But like I said, a year had passed with no acknowledgement of those grievances and demands. And then I received this picture of these rotting bananas that were left hanging on the African-Americans at Fort Hill sign in front of the plantation house. Think of being at stripes. So we kept planning. After that march at Sykes Hall, several of us decided we wouldn't leave the building until we got a response from the administrators to the issues we brought the previous January. And think of how terrible it is to not be seen, to not be acknowledged. That Wednesday, April 13th, 2015 was the first day of the Sykes sit-in. The next day, Vice President of Student Affairs, Almeida Jacks threatened me, Ian Anderson, DJ Smith, Rainisha White, and Kayla Williams with arrest for trespassing if we didn't leave the building. When we refused to leave, we were arrested while hundreds of supportive students and faculty waited outside. They processed us in the basement of Sykes rather than transport us to where processing would normally happen after an arrest. A couple of hours later, we were released with citations that were issued in the basement of the administration building on campus. Think about never being doomed to repeat an atrocious history and being better because of knowing better and doing better. I'd love to say things were smoother from there, but that would be a lie. The sit-in lasted nine days in total. That was before the summer of the Pulse nightclub shooting and the killings of Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, and Corinne Gaines. Colin Kaepernick began his protest uh, the August going into that next school year. And though he said he disagreed with Kaepernick's protest, Dabo Swinney said he wouldn't discipline a player for protesting. He said he thought the protest just created more division, though. He would go on to invoke MLK saying, quote, he changed the world with love in the face of hate, peace in the face of violence, education in the face of ignorance, and Jesus. Because as things are now, we are the tigers built on a legacy of slavery, sharecropping and convict labor by slave owners, supremacists and segregationists, but come to the campus of Clemson University and you'd hardly be able to tell it from looking around. Klan recruitment continued on campus. A group had a Make Clemson Great Again event where they invited a renowned bigot to come and speak in the auditorium named for Tillman. And it's a shame We'd be a beautiful tiger if only we could see our stripes. Those are the highlights of my first three years at Clemson. The design of this talk is representative of my approach to the work I've done since leaving Clemson and while I was there, taking a narrative that is told as history and then intervening in it, talking back to it to fill in the silences or omissions, to try to paint a fuller picture of what happened. The music I'd been making since that Wednesday I arrived was like a time capsule, an archive that I could go back through to create the playlist for my dissertation project, a rap album about what it was like living there during that time. All of the semester mixtapes 
were posted to SoundCloud as drafts. And then the finalized playlist was edited and posted to Bandcamp and embedded on a website with more context. On the dissertation site, I hosted a video and textual introduction with the conjecture and questions my project aimed to address, lyrics that would be annotated or that could be annotated through the Rap Genius website, an overview of my composing process, some text to situate the project within some academic conversations, an annotated timeline that also has hyperlinks to reading lists and bibliographies and a blog. I eventually, um, migrated the uh, See the Stripes website onto the dissertation website, but that was a few years later. Almost a year to the day after the sit-in and arrest, I defended my dissertation. I was supposed to say that I defended it in the Walt, uh, in the Walt Auditorium or Watt <laughs> Auditorium. <laughs> Um, and so, um, yeah, in 2017, well, I graduated, was left with some, I don't know, some thoughts about what Clemson might do. And, um, and ultimately came to the conclusion that Clemson university must find the courage to educate politicians, alumni, and anyone else who is resistant to change, uh, to the change that must come, that rather than ignoring and denouncing the current students and alumni who are, uh, or I'm sorry, do that rather than uh, denouncing the current students and alumni who are encouraging the necessary change. When I graduated, I was proud because I thought my work could make a difference, could maybe help amplify some questions about universities, about knowledge production, about academic engagement. And Clemson also celebrated this work. See the Stripes, of course, was one of the tracks of the dissertation album, which raises, raises those aforementioned questions among many. Another is this asked by Alexander Wahelier in Phonographies, Grooves and Sonic Afro-Modernity. Quote, what happens once the black voice becomes disembodied, severed from its source, recontextualized, and re-embodied and appropriated, or even before this point, end quote. And since then, I'm sure some of you probably know or have seen like the attempts at rebranding uh, the See the Stripes campaign, like in some kind of re or de-politicized uh, way, um, particularly the parade that was called what the Stripes that make a tiger without any acknowledgement, which might be offered as yet, well, another response to that question that Wahelier asks especially if the university isn't committed to the radical work it will take to become the kind of high seminary of learning in ways that align with uh, the current moment more closely than those uh, words ever were intended by its founder. I wanna say also that those pictures from graduation for the most part were taken by Ken Scar. Uh, he's got really dope photos, just you know, shout out to Ken Scar. Um, and the black and white picture was taken by um, Edith Dunlap, the picture um, with the police officer standing outside. Um, and so I guess, you know, to like recap this timeline that I've been taking you through. Um, yeah, I left Clemson on a Thursday. Um, that Saturday, <laughs> there was a you know, white supremacists and neo-Nazis uh, who held a rally with torches around the statue of Robert E. Lee in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I'd just been hired. I arrived that Monday um, after accepting the position that I currently um, hold here at the University of Virginia as assistant professor of hip hop in the global south in the department of music. And so, you know, I felt like the work that I had in front of me, well, was really no different and honestly, you know, my mom asked me, why do you keep cho choosing to go to places like this? And, um, you know, and I told her, well, because I live in this country, I don't know that I'm going to be able to go to a place that's not like this. 
Um, uh oh. And so the work continues. I started working on projects immediately um, titled Sleepwalking, and they take their uh, name from uh, the prologue to An Invisible Man by uh, Ralph Ellison. The first one is called Sleepwalking Volume One, the second one is Sleepwalking Volume Two. I did uh, sound design for the Royale, uh, which was um, performed uh, here in Charlottesville and directed by Leslie Scott Jones. And, and then I Used to Love to Dream is the album that I released with uh, University of Michigan Press. The next project is called Talking to Ghosts. Uh, it's not released yet, uh, but I hope it will be sometime soon. As I said before, um, it relates to that quote from the very beginning. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing it. And I guess I should also say that um, the University of uh, Michigan Press is also working with me right now on publishing a mastered version of owning my masters this spring. And so I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to kind of organize my thoughts around that album, around that work, around that time period, and then reflect a little bit with folks at Clemson about what Clemson meant to this process. And to also say that, you know, regardless of how fucked up it was whenever we were there, um, I don't know that there's any way that this project gets done if I'm not doing it in that place under those conditions. I'm not saying that I wanted those things or, yeah, no, that's, that's not the thing at all. But yeah, that's, it's just something for me to sit with. Um, so it's probably where I'll stop and open this thing up for questions because I feel like, yeah, that's it, plenty. Phenomenal. Thank you, Dr. Carson. You're applauding. I don't know if y'all are applauding like I am. But I appreciate y'all. <laughs> I was snapping and clapping and doing all kinds of things during the talk. Thank you so much. I'm letting folks get their thoughts about them. Um, Dr. Jemison, if you can moderate for us, if there are any questions, you can use the raise hand um, reaction and uh, um, we can unmute you or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Carson. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. Lots of thanks going on in the chat. Brian, Brian Smith has his hand raised. Okay. Word. Dr. Carson, excellent job as always. Word, word. appreciate you. Good, good seeing you. Likewise. <laughs> Could you talk about the some of the death threats and threats you received, not only from uh, the Clemson faithful football fans, but yeah. alumnus, et cetera? So people can understand yeah. the depth of uh, how people felt, and and not from you occupying sites, but just from you producing "See the Stripes." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that question. You know, it was it was. I mean, I thought it would be more difficult going through like all of those messages because I, I mean, I kept it all. You know, like um, I got text messages from uh, former trustees with threats, and um, and administrators and uh all yeah like it was no but like when the so like the 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 slide with all of those with all of those remarks and those emails um it was overwhelming I, I like I really I literally turned my phone off and went and got in my bed and pulled the covers over my head and uh and just laid there uh the week that the video went online um and then I turned off all of the comments for all of my social media so that I wouldn't see a comment unless I went to see the comment 
Um, I know that there was a point in time that one of my brothers, uh, he was seeing the comments and then like arguing with strangers online about stuff going on down here. One of my cousins, uh, my cousin Devin, who I actually talk about in the new um, um, album, uh, Talking to Ghosts, you know, he uh, um, was recently, well, yeah, he was recently um, murdered in Decatur. Um, but I remember so vividly Devin calling me and saying like, you know, me and Chris, you know, we gonna come down to, we gonna come down to Clemson just in case you need us. And I'm like, that's the absolute last thing that I need y'all to do is come down to Clemson. I, he's like, no, but we'll be in an unmarked van or something. And I'm like, no, please do not. Um, don't do that. Um, and I guess like, I mean, I'm saying it with a smile now, but like there was like, there was no smiling matter. I think that, like I said, those, like those pockets of community were really important to have um because like even being on social media being online i didn't even go through the yik yak comments i guess i could have put a slide together of yik yak comments to you know like really show you how how bad it was and also some of those comments were from people who you know had previously um who i previously considered friends there were also people who um who said they expressed support initially, but like it was taking too long. Like we had drawn out See the Stripes for too long and progress hadn't come. And so they said that we were just like looking for places to like looking looking for ways to be offended. And so that was pretty wild. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, and it looks like I see uh, Chindrai has, has posted the, um, the, the Tumblr with, uh, with threats and commentary because he received a lot as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. Um, for that question, Brian. And, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. I, like, I have them. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but they're here. I believe next is Demetrius Noble, then Jinjari, and then Cynthia. Okay. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, AD, for an amazing um, talk uh, and a brilliant uh performance as well i love how you kind of incorporated the the reading and performance of the poem and then a stepping out of it to provide this fascinating timeline of anti-black <laughs> violence and, and racism um that's occurring and my question actually kind of revolves um around that point um because it's really kind of fascinating to think that your entire experience there at Clemson was really um, subsumed within all of this type of anti-Black um, state violence. And then even after leaving Clemson, that kind of follows and haunts you as you go to UVA. And then the thing happens uh, in Charleston yeah. uh, with the white supremacist marching there, which leads to the, uh, to, to, to the murder. And so the, the question I'm leaning up to is obviously you had a particular set of um, politics that even allowed you to attempt to try to figure out what does it mean to be situated within this space with these particular aims. I'm curious, yeah. how has your politics and cultural production e even been kind of further sharpened or informed by being within the crucible of, of all of the stuff going on in Clemson and then even at UVA and, and trying to teach, still trying to be a radical cultural worker. Can you just kind of talk about all of these various kind of forces and how that kind of continued to inform um, your art? Were there certain things that you abandoned, certain new things that you type attempted to kind of pick up in terms of the art that you wanted to make and, the, and, and whatnot? Yeah, yeah, no, I really appreciate that question, D Noble. Um, the, you know, one thing that, like, I mean, there, there's a, there is a reason. You know, I'm not, I'm not just quoting Chenderai because I like that song. Like, I think that, um, I think that what he says there is actually, it's instructive. Like in a, I mean, it's instructive, in, in a way that, like, just sort of, like, it, it just like reverberates. Like, we wrote that song in response to audio from Twelve Years a Slave while being on a plantation and him coming from um him coming from um from Pennsylvania me coming from Illinois and we went and we watched that film and just like felt haunted by it and I think we didn't speak for three days and then I was like yo here's here's the thing like I think that we need to like you know talk back to that so like that it's not like just the the 
to burn down the plantation regardless. It's really the ghost told me never fear the darkness. That's where the realest part is. And, um, and I guess I'll just say that like being in front of the class or, you know, like being in the faculty meeting, like that's way different. It's way different. And I think that you have all kinds of opportunities to like put down, you know, like all of the, you know, like all of the, 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 the things that have gotten you to that point um, abandon them and then like sort of go for what seems safer now that like you are in this, like, you know, in, 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 in this space. And, um, and I just, I can't do it. I can't like, even if I wanted to, I don't think that I could. And so, um, I think that what I did abandon was like trying to explain, like, like, I think I, I was, I was saying this yesterday to my classes, to my graduate class, like, you know, what, what is the response to absurdity? Like what's, what is the proper response to absurdity? And I'm sure that like, honestly, I'm sure this is a question that Victor asked at some point, like, you know, in a class. Um, at some point, you know, like trying to answer absurdity, like earnestly makes you seem like the absurd person. So I'm, I feel like this work is like the work that I need to do. Like I am speaking to the people who are speaking to me earnestly. I'm speaking to the people who are earnestly listening to me. Other folks are around and it's not my job to tell a person in response to why didn't you make that for me? Why I didn't make it for them? Because I didn't. And also, but, but I'm not even going to offer you that as the answer. You know, I might smile and nod. I don't know. But um maybe just make more music about it. And so, yeah, that's been, um, yeah, like that's, that's been the thing that like, that, that, that I'm really holding on to is how different it is from the front of the classroom and like, like how empowering it can be to make the classroom the space where students do that kind of work that felt, and it wasn't, but felt extracurricular whenever I was down there in Clemson. Appreciate the question. I'm going to let, uh, yeah, the next person. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, I guess I'll come on screen briefly. Um, hey, this thank you, first of all, to everyone who made this space possible. This is an important space to have these conversations. So much respect for that. And thank you to AD for this incredible, you know, uh, reflection and intervention. My question is this. One of the ironies about things like, you know, sort of phenomena like what you described at this at research, you know, universities is that you have this kind of um, sort of form of racial trauma and actually racial terror, right? When you're, when you're being, when you're arrested underneath, you know, the, a building in Clemson and being threatened, I, I, I call that a form of terror um, as a yeah. student. Um, but um, when you have trustees sort of threatening you in different ways or former trustees, excuse me, you know, but one of the things is that this can unfold, often unfolds, not just at Clemson, but at many universities. And then one of the ironies is that the universities then find ways to recuperate the very same protests to actually promote themselves even further, putting yeah. students on flyers and so forth, and yeah. thus kind of like seeming to have dealt with things. But I guess, so my question to you is, what, how have you felt about seeing that process unfold at Clemson while you were there and then after you left? And, I, and specifically at Clemson, like what you see at Clemson while you were there and left in terms of how they've chosen to sort of respond and uh, recuperate these efforts. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I appreciate that question. And I almost, I, I, I almost included um, the, there was at, at one point, there was a protest that was on, it must've been a January or a February where the protest um, that was never like really like respond, responded to in any kind of, uh, you know, like satisfactory way by the uh, administrators, uh, like the protest protesters appear on like the landing page for the, the Clemson website. And yeah, that's frustrating. Um, and so I wrote, I know that on the blog for the, for the, the website, it, it's, uh, there's an essay um, called uh, Pimping the Stripes. Um, when, um, when, when, universities, when, when universities use PR, to avoid doing the radical work of diversity and inclusion. And um, and no, it well, it's not like it's not like none of this work was stuff that I 
uh, wasn't willing to uh, share, you know, like strategies and thoughts with those people, you know, like administrators at the university or, you know, like um, even, you know, like whichever trustees wanted to meet, like that I wouldn't share those things with them. What I refuse to do, however, is be bullied. And then somebody is like, well, you can't say it that way or you can't say that thing because like I'm a whole grown man. Like you're not going to tell me what I can't say. That's weird. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's frustrating because, you know, like I can imagine someone saying like they, they see this project and then they're like, Clemson is the kind of place that you go to do this work. And then like they might go there and then be traumatized in the same way, aiming to do that kind of work. And they'd be like, well, no, I didn't <laughs> like I didn't I didn't show up here to be traumatized. But like, shit, it took a I mean, like a good year and a half of therapy before I could even like hear the word Clemson and not react in like a very visceral, like, you know, like, nah, don't even do it kind of way. Um, so I don't know. It, I mean, it's hard to navigate because I still feel like that, that same kind of recuperation goes on in a place like UVA uh, because like they could very easily point at what happened at Clemson, you know, like being Thomas Jefferson's university and then say, we're different than that. And the end, I mean, truthfully, you ain't. You ain't like, I, I mean, I know, I know where my bread is buttered, you know, like I, I totally understand that, but like, let's not like try to make Thomas Jefferson into something other than, you know, like the Calhouns and the, uh, in the Clemsons and the Tillmans of the world, because like, you know, like they got a whole lot more in common with each other than they have with me. So, I mean, I hope that that's sufficient. I know that there's a lot more that could probably be said. Thank you. Next question was Cynthia. Then we have Christina, Mark. Ken. I'm going to actually put Sneha before Ken because I saw her hand earlier. And then Leslie. Cynthia. Hi, AD. Uh, that was so powerful and uh, not surprisingly so. Um, so happy that we could help sponsor your, your being here and being with us and even in a virtual way. Um, I know I've said this to you and, and about you and many times that we are proud of you. But it's been something I've been thinking about that phrase because it feels like owning you. And I don't I don't like that feeling. I think we should say that the ARCID program would prefer to say we are with you, um, standing with you, uh, standing under you, understanding you. I remember when you stayed with Jan and me um, in our home as you were scouting apartments in the spring of 2013. You were telling me about your time as a high school teacher in Springfield Decatur and having to get weapons out of your classroom that students brought into the room. And I was shocked and I thought, man, you know, you've had a lot. <laughs> you've dealt with a lot and you're going to teach us a lot. And um I, I but but you're you're always so calm in a, in a way or seemingly so about violence. And then three years, four years later, I, I was standing with you after all of this has happened on the Cooper Library Bridge, and I found myself standing with you, looking around at the top of the buildings for snipers, and it terrified me that that was my thought that I needed to protect you, or that. Um, I had to be on the lookout and um, I haven't ever forgotten that feeling. I will always feel that, that we, we have to be so alert. Um, and, and that is an awareness that you have helped bring us. I'm not happy that it happened to you, that these death threats happened and the threat of violence, but I just wanted to tell you that we are with you. We're not just or even proud of you, okay? Thank you so much for who you are Thank you. And for talking I, no, to us today. No, I appreciate that, uh, Cynthia. Really, I do. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we are going to move through these next ones expeditiously because we are okay. at the top of the hour. We're having people log off. Oh, okay. I well, see Christina, Sneha, Ken, Leslie, and those will be our last questions, if that's all right. Word. Hey, Christina, I can't hear you, though. Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Uh, 
I don't want to take too long, but I do want to thank all of the sponsors here at Clemson who have brought you in. Thank you for doing that work. It's so important. Um, and I want to thank you, AD, for not abandoning us now that you've left Clemson. <laughs> AD has been committed to this work in this institution um, up to this day, up to this very moment. And that's really, really important. Um, also, I don't know all the people who've spoken and asked questions before me, but, but they've asked some really great conversations. We, I could go on all day talking and talking to them and talking to you about this. Um, just to get to the point, I have uh, my question, obviously from my perspective as someone who came to Clemson to do this hard work, mm -hmm. been, tra been traumatized, and, I, and here I am, I'm still here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a, in some ways others have asked this before, but from your perspective now, as a professor, a doctor, professor mm -hmm. at a major uh, public state university, right? And you've been sort of at, you know, part of the inner workings, right? Um, what can you share with us about how uh, how we might move forward as an institution and as concerned faculty, staff, and students trying to move Clemson forward? Because it's a really tough nut to crack, yeah. you know? The whole state is just locked down in its own racism and and I know there are so many people on campus and who have been on campus for periods of time doing this really, really, really hard work. But at some level, we still have Tillman Hall, mm -hmm. right? Right. And do you have any insights now from your perspective being part of a machine? Yeah. Thanks. Well, I mean, I know that one of one of the things is, you know, as, sim as simple as like, um, and maybe it's not simple, but you know, like we have to have all, all like alternate histories in order to hold institutions accountable. And those have to be archived outside of the institutions because if they're housed within the institutions, then they're going to be able to put up a, they're going to be able to put up a sign um, that says that they did something <laughs> without announcing it. I mean, I'm talking about Clemson. Clemson definitely did this, uh, you know, put up a sign, said that they did something. Don't announce it until after all of the people who, uh, like should be given at least an acknowledgement for pushing you to do that work. They're going to be like, oh yeah, we thought of this all by ourselves. Or they put on a parade and they say, we'll call it the stripes that make a tiger. And then like, we're just going to march in a very like undiverse crowd, like looking solid orange still, but then pretend as if, you know, like they're doing that. And so if you don't have something that is like, um, that is adjacent to the institution that is also holding the institution responsible, then the institution is going to be able to tell its own history and, um, you know, like, you know, uh, wash, rinse, repeat every four years. Uh, so I kept all the stuff about Clemson with me um, because like that, because I was there, but like at that moment where folks at, um, you know, like when the, the folks in the, in the, um, Honors College wanted to, like, they started these things back up. There were people on faculty who, who were like, hey, you want to, somebody said kind of like America, huh? Yes, exactly like America. Like, uh, there are people who will, um, you know, there were, there were folks who said, hey, like, you might want to reach out. And I'm like, no, yeah, I'm here. Like, you know, I'm as much an alumnus as any of those people who paint their faces orange and, like, do all that, like, weird shit on Saturdays. Um, so, yeah, I'm here for that. Like, and no, I probably won't tell tailgate with you. But like, you know, I think that like we all like we have we come in all stripes, I imagine. So, um, you know, like I think that like maybe like those folks also, um, you know, go into those alumni associations and you know, like the spaces that are adjacent to the institution that can hold the institution responsible. I just don't understand. Like, I mean, like school pride, I get, but like, isn't it like the school version of nationalism that like fucks everybody over? Like, you just can't be critical. And again, like, I'm not walking around on a plantation talking about, I just love this plantation. That's, yeah, like, I'm not going to do it. And then like, and then, and then somebody's like, oh, but the employees, they, I mean, like Calhoun must've really liked them, fam, like. That, that's weird. That's a weird stance. So I think that that's like a big thing that can be done. 
uh, that should be done. And that's a thing that I am encouraging here at UVA. And that's also not a thing that UVA is going to do, you know, like for or against itself because it doesn't stand to gain anything. And once UVA is like sort of in it and running it, then you know that that's like not the place where the history needs to be. Right. Yeah. Noted. Noted outside of the adjacent. To yeah. Thank you. You better preach. You better preach. I'm about to go in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They definitely didn't drop those charges. Um, yeah, folks had to come out of pocket. I see that, Brian. Um, is the next person Sneha or uh, or or Ken? Sneha had her hand up first, and then okay, she dropped smart. it and came back up. So Sneha, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Carson, for the inspirational talk. It was, in fact, insightful and thought-provoking because I'm a person from not from your country. So to hear your personal experiences, it's, in fact, sad as well as... Um, but I hope, you know, you get through it. And, in fact, you are making history, you know, by this. And I just have a small question. Uh, could you please enumerate your thoughts on... Um, how we can counter tokenism, uh, especially in, you know, in the name of diversity and inclusion, there is a lot of tokenism that is going on and prevalent. And I would just want to know how can we uh, counter it and ensure legit inclusion, especially within academy? Yeah, I mean, I think that like some of it is really is like challenging, like these things that that um well, you know, there are all these things that, that, that seem to, you know, like what, what is neutral, you know, like, or, or, I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate about the RCID program is that I wasn't told, I wasn't told what I had to do. There were definitely some things that, that, that folks did, but like when those challenges came, they were conversations about like how it gets done uh, and what it's going to look like rather than, um, I mean, it's like even weird, like in some ways to say like, it's a non-traditional dissertation because, well, I mean, I, I understand that it's talking about like sort of against like all of those other things. The combating tokenism, like as an individual, I think that that's like, that's super difficult, like because that's something that has to happen like from, you know, like sort of a departmental institutional level um, because, you know, like this, this idea of exceptionalism is always going to be a thing that, uh, you know, institutions will be able to uh, you know, quarter, sort of like a uh, bottle and then like, um, and then, and then retail as the story of like how good they are at doing that work. Um, and so some of it is just like, some of, for me, like, I know, like, I actually know that like the thing that you're describing as tokenism is a way that like some folks receive the work that I am doing and where I'm doing it. I hope that whenever they get the work, they under, like, they feel differently about it. But if they never, because they are like sort of thrown off by the fact that it's coming like sort of under this like sort of uh, like this uh, veneer of novelty, um, then they'll never really like get into the message. And so I think like it's kind of, I mean, I wish I could say that it was like deliberately subversive, but like, um, you know, like I say, like I say what I say, you know, I'm not trying to say it in some way, you know, or try to do it like in a more polite way. Um, but again, like that's not a thing that I can do as an individual, because even being a person who says what they say, uh, like you can still, you know, like sort of be uh, articulated as, you know, like somebody's, you know, show pony. Um, and I'm certain that that happens. Um, it doesn't change the thing that I make. That doesn't change the thing that I do. And um, again, like when like being in the position, you know, if I'm a person who's thinking about accepting students or if I'm a person who's uh, working from the front of the classroom, um, you know, I have more, more say so in it, but, you know, like as a person whose work is um, trying to push those boundaries, there are some people who are going to treat it as if it's, you know, uh, yeah, you know, like that, that thing, you know, the shiny new thing. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Scar. Hey, Dr. Carson, it's great to see you. I'm proud right. to know you, my friend. Word. Hey, real quick, I just, I always thought it was the height of irony and tragedy that you went through everything you went through here at Clemson mm -hmm. and then went to the University of Virginia and no sooner did you get there, but they had white nationalist riots, the infamous riots with the tiki torches. 
Did yeah. you feel like you jumped out of the frying pan into the fire? And I hope things are going well for you there now. Word, I, I appreciate that. Like, I, well, this here's the thing. Like, like, so this is another thing that, like, if you're looking at it, I mean, it's kind of like you're you're kind of having to having to look at it like through like sort of the uh like the the hall of mirrors kind of perspective. That this this entire time we thought like in Clemson we had gone back like 50 years and everybody was like sort of in the past. And who would have known that we were actually in the future? Like we were living in America's future during the time from 2013 to 2017, because like it became like this, everything that was going on on campus locally uh, and in uh, statewide, like ended up being like the national, you know, like political situation that we're like still currently in. So um, when I when I left to come here, it was like, oh, no, th- like it didn't even feel like it was spreading. It's like, this is the exact same thing. It, it got bigger. Um, and I don't even know if it spread or if it got bigger more than it just got louder. It got louder and then it was like, it was on camera. And so, you know, I kept saying that like, you know, like if, if America is this like huge crime scene, um, Clemson was one place where uh, certain um where, where certain evidence was like uncovered and like we were uncovering it and everybody like from the administration, they were like saying, no, it's not a thing. It's not, you know, it's like nothing to see here. They don't want to investigate. Um, and then like, you know, you saw in these places, those places I named Beaver Creek and Cleveland and Baltimore, like this was just evidence of the same crime. It was just like popping up everywhere. And then at some point, like folks have to like come together and say, like, we're all investigating the same crime. Like we're, we're all in the same crime scene. And so that's kind of how I started to look at it, uh, because like I, I mean, that's no comfort to my mom. Like I said, she she didn't you know, she wasn't um, <laughs> she she wasn't convinced by that. But I'm like, no, I'm gonna be cool, you know, and I don't even like going outside that much. So, you know, I'm not. I'm, yeah, we'll be we'll be good. Uh, you know, we'll be safe, um, and even though like, you know, of course, I couldn't tell her all of the stuff that was you know really going on. But I try to you know, I try to be safe and, and, and it's it doesn't feel it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel outside of America. I guess that's the best. I mean, that's the way that I'm trying to say it. Like, yeah. But thank you for that question, Ken. And also thanks, you know, for, for the pictures and the words and everything else. I appreciate you. Thank you. Our last question will be from Leslie Scott Jones. And, but that doesn't mean the questions will not stop. Word, word, word. <laughs> Hi, AD. So good to see you. I miss your face. Likewise. Um, um, so there's a question that uh, I have been having with a lot of Black artists as um, the theater program here ramps up for our new season. And one of the things we have been talking through and grappling with is as a Black artist, whatever your medium that uses life experience as muse, how do you, do you believe that Black artists should create in segregation from the white gaze, if that's ever possible, (laughs) or in segregation from white artist collaborators. Like how, is that something that as Black artists we need to do in order to clarify our own voices? Hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's a song on the dissertation called Talking to White Folks. And it was like, it was very like, it was because I needed to make sure that like, like that. I know. I, I mean, you know, and I say like, you know, like, like you can go tell them I said it, I meant it. I tell them myself if, uh, you know, if they, if, um, if they willing to hear it. And, you know, like I thought that that, that was important because like, you know, for folks to kind of think like this isn't for me or you're not talking to me or you're not talking about me. Um, I think that there's benefit of, um, of, uh, there is some benefit to, I mean, but most of the time I'm not, I'm not thinking about them whenever I'm making what I make. I think, I think that most of the time I'm not, but like, I also know that like, even if I'm not thinking about somebody listening, like they're still listening or they're still, you know, there's something that they might, might get from it. Um, And so, no, I don't know. I I mean, I really like, that's, it's a great question, but I don't know if, um, yeah, I don't know if it's possible. I don't know what it what it looks like to produce outside of knowing that somebody, uh, you know, that that 
that that somebody is going to uh, to hear it and try to appropriate it in certain ways, or you know, like just sort of enjoy it, and then like I I'll feel weird about it because like of who I see enjoying it. Um, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, again, I, I'm thinking like a lot of times when I'm making stuff now, I'm thinking about my friends that I'm, a, you know, like that I'm going to play it for, or I'm thinking about my family members. Like I'm, I'm thinking of those people who I'm in conversation with. And then sometimes like even when I am like for like I used to love to dream, I used that Decatur uh, documentary, but I didn't do that to like speak back to Decatur. It's using what Decatur says about itself so that we might have a history that like tells a different thing. And like those folks might be put off because of me rapping on it. But um, yeah, that's not for them. Like it's because whenever like there's this thing and it says like like movies about Decatur, Illinois and none of them ever have anybody that look like me or sound like me or look or sound like my grandma, my grandpa, then um, I'm gonna make something that does that. And so, um, you know, like like in, in a world where you're, you're, you're having to consume all of this art or you're, you're, you're side by side with all of this art and all of these things that are that are produced by so many other people. Um, I think that you'll be influenced by a whole lot. And um, and I think that like, you know, anybody within earshot is is going to listen. But I don't. Yeah, I still but I I'm talking a lot, but I don't know that I can say anything about how or who people should or should not um, make things with because I mean, like my class, like I want them to make things like within their class, but like whenever they like want to work with other folks, I'm like, yeah, you could do that as well. You can, I mean, I think that we can do, you know, we can do multiple, we can do multiple things. I think that sometimes, you know, it, it's really good to have um, some conversations about what it is that we are making or what the implications are of what we are making if we're making things together or we're making things, uh, you know, like sort of, uh, you know, within proximity of each other. Um, cause you know, like that could get, you know, kind of sticky, but I don't know. I don't see myself making anything with anybody I'm not willing to talk to. So yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have a, a better answer. I'm probably going to be thinking about that all, all week. <laughs> well, then we'll have to have a phone conversation. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Carson. But I also want to thank the audience. Thank you all for staying this long. Thank you for hearing every and absorbing everything Dr. Carson had to say. I also invite us to continue this conversation. Dr. Carson has experienced a lot. He got beat up on the inside, beat up on the outside. And we need to learn the lessons um, without him being having to experience it again for us. So let's continue these conversations. Thank you all. We wrap this conversation. Asante sana. <laughs> Thank you. Thank y'all. Peace.